Okay, everybody, last video of the night. This one's going to be on uh, intuition builders and wrap up. What we're going to do is I'm just going to go through a couple of scenarios, which I think especially exemplify the three laws. Um, I'll probably throw a little bit of math in there here and there, but it's not going to be a super quantitative exploration of the three laws. I'm just going to kind of show you what I think of when I think of each law. Hopefully this will help build some intuition and make it uh, easier for you to decide which law or laws are relevant in solving a given problem. Okay, let's hop into it. Okay, so the first law I want to touch is the first law. <laughs> so Newton's first law says that, oops, let's get an actual text box here. If the sum of forces, of external forces on a body are, is zero, then the change in velocity is zero. In other words, velocity is conserved. Velocity is conserved. So the way that I write this as an equation is if the sum of external forces, the vector sum, is zero, then delta v equals zero. An object in motion stays in motion at constant velocity unless acted upon by a net external force. Okay, so there are two examples which come to mind for me when I'm thinking about uh, Newton's first law. The first is of a hockey puck. So this is the pretty classic example of a hockey puck moving along on frictionless ice. So let's say the hockey puck, here we go, it's moving along. It's got some velocity v. There's my velocity vector v. And I'm going to kind of mix vectors here. So I'm going to draw force vectors as well on this chart. But typically, you'd want to split it up. But I'm going to do it just because I'm cavalier. All right. <laughs> but uh, I'll draw the forces in pink. I just leave the velocity in orange so we can kind of tell what direction it's going. OK. So there's two forces that are acting on this puck on a frictionless surface under the influence of Earth's gravity. So one force is the gravitational force, which pulls it down. Uh, into the ground, so to speak. Now, if that were the only force, the puck would be accelerating in that direction. So if that were to be the only force, the puck would have to sink into the ice. Uh, clearly, that doesn't happen, right? If you just launch a hockey puck down some ice, that's not going to happen. So there's a restorative force. This is a force, we'll call it the normal force. It's a force that opposes the pressing together of things. So it's it's a force that opposes forcing two things to occupy the same position in space, in this case, the ice and the hockey puck. So these two forces are going to cancel. And my net force, F net, which is the sum of those two forces, the normal force plus the gravitational force, those two things sum to zero, the zero vector. So there is no net force, which means that my hockey puck will just keep going at a constant velocity as long as it can. So, you know ad infinitum until it runs out of frictionless ice, right? So the hockey puck just keeps going at the same speed. The hockey puck just keeps going. Now, of course, in a real, uh, in a real like hockey system, <laughs> you're going to have friction. So in a real system, I might have a friction force that acts in the opposite direction of velocity. We'll come back to that in just a second. First, I want to talk about another example that I think of as an archetype of, uh, of Newton's first law, which is the example of rogue planets. So a rogue planet is a planet which has been spat out of its solar system. So maybe Jupiter and uh, Uranus uh, gang up on Earth, and they combine their gravitational power in some kind of like cataclysmic event when we're accidentally too close to them. And we just get ricocheted out too far away from the sun to come back. If you get ricocheted out too far as a planet, you can become a rogue planet, doomed to wander uh, interstellar space. You just kind of get stuck out there where there's nobody to interact with, no forces on you, and you're just stuck moving at a constant speed V through the cosmos until eventually you run into another solar system and then you get caught in another gravitational well. Um, you get caught in somebody else's gravity. But for that time, when you're just floating out there in space with basically nobody around you, no net external forces, you just keep going. You just keep going at a constant speed. There's nothing out there in space to slow you down. Um, yeah, nothing out there in inter interstellar space, basically, to slow you down. 
So you just keep going, same velocity. Those are my two archetypes for Newton's first law. Those are the things that I think of. Places where the sum of external forces is zero, like the hockey puck, sans friction. And places where there just are no net, or there are no forces. So the sum of net forces is like trivially zero. Okay, so let's return to this example of the hockey puck. For Newton's second law, for Newton's second law, here we go. I've got two examples I want to talk about. One is of a simple force acting on an object. Okay, so if I take my hockey puck here, and I have now a friction force that opposes the direction of the, of the velocity, friction, well now there is a net force. The net force, since, for, since gravity and uh, the normal force cancel in this case, the net force is just that friction force. So F net is the sum of all the forces. Uh, sum of the forces, I'll just say F sub I, just to indicate I'm summing over each of my three forces. And because the normal force and the gravitational force cancel, I'm going to be left over with only the friction force. So the net force is the friction force. What I now know, what I now know using Newton's second law, which is that force is mass times acceleration, is that this hockey puck is going to accelerate in the direction of the friction vector at a rate inversely proportional to its mass. So the acceleration vector is going to be this friction force divided by the mass of the puck, m. There we go. Okay, so say that I had a friction force that was 30 newtons, 30 newtons, and I had a mass that was 20 kilograms. Uh, actually, let's make it more realistic. Let's say it's half a kilogram. There we go. It's a real hockey puck. It's not like a super massive Rocket League style hockey puck. <laughs> so, um, so friction force of 30 newtons, uh, half a kilogram mass. That would mean that my acceleration is 60 newtons per kilogram, newton per kilogram which is 60 meters per second squared. That's how quickly that thing would slow down. That's pretty fast. That's a big, <laughs> that's a big acceleration. Okay, that's 10 times, or six times gravity, right? Six times gravity, because gravity is 10 meters per second. So this is also called six Gs. Okay, the other one that I think of commonly is basically the same scenario, honestly, except for flipped. So. <laughs> A mass that's falling. So there's this force of gravity on it. The mass falls. The um, force on this mass is given by the mass times the acceleration. And acceleration for gravity is just a constant. Regardless of your mass, the acceleration due to gravity is a constant number. So that's m times g, where g, in this case, I'll say points down. So I'll say the g vector points down here. Uh, that's just a sign convention choice on my part. You're free to choose whatever you want, what, whether g points up or down. And then you'd say like negative mg if you defined g to point up. Anyway, kind of a kind of a minor point. So if I have a 500 kilogram mass, 500 kilogram mass, I know what the gravitational acceleration due to Earth's gravity is. That's 10 meters per second squared. That tells me that the force on this mass of 500 kilograms is 5,000 newtons. 5,000 newtons. Okay, those are my two archetypal examples for when I might use Newton's second law, which tells me about how, uh, how acceleration is affected by force. What force does to, uh, to the rate of change of velocity. Okay, the last one, of course, is Newton's third. Newton's third, I just wanted to give an, a couple examples of these pairs. So the, what do we call them? Uh, Newtonian force pairs. So the claim again is that between any two bodies, between any two bodies, the force on one body due to the second body is equal to the negative force on the second body by the first body. So anytime two objects interact, they both, they both cause forces on one another. Those forces are the same size and in opposite direction. So in gravitation, I see that, and, in, and again, this is the example I used in my previous slides. In gravitation, I see that as the force of gravity on the moon, say, equaling the force of gravity on the Earth, but in opposite directions. 
and on opposite characters, so to speak, one on the Earth, one on the Moon. In uh, in normal forces, say I'm squeezing my two fingers together. All right, is this a good drawing of fingers? It kind of is. All right, let's go. So the force, I'll call them, here's finger one, here's finger two. Let's call them left and right. Left and right. So the force on my left finger due to my right finger, LR, is the same in magnitude and opposite direction as the force on my right finger due to my left finger. They push against each other with the same magnitude. Okay, um, finally, in intermolecular forces, intermolecular attraction and repulsion, let's say I have, I don't know, let's, call, let's this time call it two protons. A proton and another proton. So like charges tend to repel. So anytime there's a force between two protons, so you can think back to 7a if you like. Ooh. <laughs> anytime there's a force between two charged objects, the force that one experiences due to the other, I'll call this one one, this one two, the force on one due to two is equal and opposite the force on the other. Force due to two on one. Okay. So <clears throat> critically, with a third law, equal and opposite. They're the same in size, opposite in magnitude, opposite in terms of who they impact. I think that's it for these uh, intuition builders. We will see how these transform into equations that define how velocities change, how positions change, um, and so on in the very next lecture, which will be on kinematics.